All right, well, why don't we jump in this morning? We get to start a journey together. We're calling it GLOW, where the dark meets the light. We're gonna talk about what that's really trying to communicate in a moment. But I wanted to start with a thought that's kind of personal to me. And it's probably personal to you in various ways. That as, as a Christian, we have this 2,000 or so year history that if you were to look at Christian history, there's been various moments where instead of putting Jesus at the center of the life of a community or the life of a person who claims to be Christian, we found other things to put in first place. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah. Sometimes it led to violence. Sometimes it led to death, suffering, hypocrisy, and, and it's hard because you, you've probably noticed that even in our own lives, those of us who say, you know what, I, I want to pursue Jesus with all I have, we're always tempted to put politics in the middle or, or appropriate cultural practices and mores in the middle, preference in the middle, who's in and out based on, you know, if they're like me enough or not, right? Like we're always tempted to put the wrong things in the center of our lives and in our church communities. And in my early 20s, I, I started really wrestling with this, right? And maybe you've wrestled with some of this yourself. Why is it that so often the church of Jesus Christ looks unchrist-like? We have a PR problem, but we have a centering problem. We sometimes put the wrong thing in the center. And, and as a result, some people are like, I don't want to be associated with that. I don't go, I'm, I'm done with church. I'm done with, it. I'm still religious in the sense of like, I'm spiritual, but I'm not. Yeah, they, they keep putting the wrong thing in the center. So people give up on faith. They give up on what they thought could be good. They may say, Jesus is great, but that's all I like. And, and I get it because we all want to be associated with something that matters. We all want to be associated with something other than an institution that behaves badly. Deep in our bones, we want to be part of something that actually matters. We want to be part of something good. And here's what's fascinating. We want to be part of something good even if we're not that good. Anybody? Right? So, so we just want like our brand, the thing people think of when they see us to be nice, pleasant, good, holy, wh whatever it is. And sometimes we struggle just to like bridge the gap between what we want to be associated with and who we actually are. Now, it's interesting. There's a great, great, I don't know if I want to say great. There is an example of this in church history where they put the wrong thing in the center. Uh, you may know this if you studied history. I, I just find it so fascinating. Uh, years ago, people thought the earth was the center of the universe. You wanna, I have a picture actually. Right, so, so people used to think that the universe was essentially the earth and things were around it, including the sun. And, and the earth was really the focal point. This is called a geocentric universe. It was the view of common times. If you grew up in, West, in the Western world, in the Middle Ages, this was your understanding of how the cosmos was formed. The only problem is we know it wasn't the actual way the cosmos was arranged, don't we? So the church was like geocentric universe. The earth is the middle. The earth is the middle. The earth is the center. And then a guy named Copernicus comes along in the 1500s and a guy named Galileo in the 1600s. And they start saying, hey, hey, based on my research and my telescoping, right? We think we've got this wrong. Now, some of you who are actually into science are like, Kurt, you're killed. This is a terrible description. <laughs> Fair enough. This is the layman's term kind of thing, right? I, I'm a words person, not a, anyway, continuing on. Uh, but, but they come along and they say, hey, what if the sun is the center of our galaxy? You didn't have to just be Roman Catholic because if you were Protestant, you agreed with Catholics on this one. 
That's sin. That's wrong. That's heresy. In fact, at one point, Copernicus's books are condemned by the Inquisition. They are not to be read because they were propagating something that went against one verse in the Bible in Joshua chapter 12. He prays that the sun would stand still. And of course, if the sun is the middle, it can't stand still. So they said the earth is the center. And it took a long time for these heresy hunters to lose. But eventually they did, and we now know that the sun is actually in the middle. You know, it's interesting because we, we could put all kinds of historical examples of this where the center is wrong. They had put their idea about how the world was arranged because of a Bible verse in the center. And they got it wrong. And here's what I want us to see this morning. This is probably the biggest idea that, that we need to really hold. Our center determines our shaping. Our center determines our shaping. Who you are becoming, who you're being shaped into is directly related to what you put in the center of your life and the communities you are a part of. You can't get around it. And you can even put something like Jesus in the center and, and actually rebel against that center and be shaped in the opposite direction, but the center will define your shaping. Whatever we make the main thing makes everything, it shapes us. So today, what are we doing? We are starting a series called Glow, Where the Dark Meets the Light. And this, my friends, is a six-week series where we're going to explore ministry values around here. We're going to explore the core DNA of where we believe God is taking us as a church community. And today, we are starting with one that you might have already guessed, Jesus-centered. But before we do that, I want to read you a passage of scripture that kind of frames the entire series for us a little bit here. Why are we calling this glow? Matthew chapter five says this, you are the light of the world. A city on top of a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a basket. Instead, they put it on top of a lampstand and it shines on all who are in the house. So Jesus here is giving us a word picture, a metaphor for what it means to be his people. He continues and says, in the same way, let your light shine before people so they can see the good things you do and praise your father who is in heaven. Jesus teaches that to be his followers, we are together to light up the world. We are the glowing presence. Now, don't drink some weird chemical and start to glow, right? This metaphor, right? Turpentine or I don't know. Anyway, like don't, don't do that. But at this real life level, we are the light and love of God insofar that we place Jesus in the middle of all of it. And so today, that's what we're gonna look at. Jesus-centered we seek Jesus and his kingdom first. We seek Jesus and his kingdom first. He's the point. He gets first place. Jesus wins. This is good news, my friends. This is very good news. Now, I want to show you one more image that helps us sort of orient around where we're going together today. We've talked about this in the past, so I'm not gonna spend tons of time on it. But what you'll see up there is a, a, two different approaches to any kind of community you could have. It could be a community of learning, it, could be, it doesn't have to be Christian. But I want you to see the difference. So a bounded community would be the kind of community that says, our goal is to get all of the same kinds of people who agree on the same sorts of things inside 
the club. You follow? And so the whole goal of a bounded approach, I know we're getting academic, we'll come back down, but this is really important. Like the whole goal of a bounded approach is I'm going to police the line. The line might be my beliefs about in church, beliefs about God, my ideas about which Bible translation is the right one, my ideas about whether alcohol is allowed or not allowed. It might be all kinds of different things. Am I Calvinist, am I Arminian? All of that stuff, right? We can, we can kind of look at the line and say, our goal is to police the line so that only those who are blue like us, only those who are inside are actually in. Now, a Jesus-centered approach to church says something a little bit different. It's not as though there's no boundaries, but the goal is how can we more and more relate to Jesus at the center, get to know Jesus, learn from Jesus, and as we pursue Jesus, the things that Jesus taught are going to be sorted out together. And so you could be in a centered community and be aiming towards Jesus with your life and you are part of this journey. That's how you know you're in. You are orienting your life as best as you can. This is not about perfection, but you are orienting your heart and your intention around Jesus with other people. And then other people might opt out of that journey. By the way, people who have opted out of that journey are still welcome here if they're curious. That matters. Do you see the difference? When Jesus is at the center, I am getting closer and closer to knowing and following and experiencing Jesus at different levels as I continue in my pursuit of him. I don't have to police the line. Jesus is going to show me the boundaries that help me follow him and get closer to him. I don't need to police any line. Jesus at the center changes everything. So our center determines our shaping. And so for the next few minutes, I want us to really explore what the Bible says about Jesus-centeredness. We'll add a ness to it. And what I want us to do is really look at why putting Jesus at the center matters so much. Now, um, if any of you are wondering, that's not to the neglect of the whole Trinity, right? But what we're going to see is over and over again that the Spirit points to Jesus. The Father amplifies Jesus, right? Jesus is the embodiment of God. And so we're, we're going to really explore the vision the New Testament has about what happens if you and I decide to put Jesus at the center of our lives, our families, our friendships, and our church. So, great place to start is a letter called Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 1 We don't really know who wrote it. Uh, There's a season where people thought it was Paul, but that's actually gone and passed. But what we do know is that the church regarded this as Holy Scripture from a very, very early time. And this is what the writer of the Hebrews says. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom he also made the universe. Let's, let's pause there. So, so God says, all of the revelation that has come before has been leading to this moment. And this moment is, you now have the best reflection and representation of who I am in the person of Jesus of Nazareth, who lived, died, and resurrected, and is reigning at the right hand of God the Father. Yeah? This is God's final word to humanity, Jesus. By the way, that same Jesus was, a, was the creator of the universe. Get that. Right? So he wasn't just born in you know, the year zero. Like he, he, he was the creator of everything. Verse 3. The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. And in case we didn't get the point, you go down a little bit in this chapter, verse eight, quoting, uh, I believe from a Psalm, 
the writer says, but about the son, he says, your throne, O God, will last forever and ever. The writer of Hebrews wants you to know that Jesus isn't secondary. Jesus is, in fact, God. You following? Okay, this is what matters here. That if this Jesus is God's final word to humankind, full and complete revelation of who God is when it comes to character and actual essence, God looks like Jesus. That's the first big idea today. God looks, excuse me, like Jesus. God is not a God like Zeus ready to thunderbolt you as you walk by because you said a curse word. None of you do that, I know, I know, none of you do that. God looks like Jesus. Now, if we are gonna be shaped like Jesus, he has to be in the front. He has to be in the center. He has to be the thing that we pursue together. It's one of those things that if we, we miss this, if, if we miss Jesus in the middle, we miss the whole point of why you're here today. And it's not just that. You miss the opportunity for a life that is like no other. When Jesus is at the center, your life with others is so different. Colossians pushes us even further. Colossians chapter one says this, the son is the image of the invisible God. So in case we didn't get the picture, Jesus is the image of the invisible God. And, and it's really important that we understand this. This is a, a dual image that Paul is using here. On the one hand, he's saying, when you see Jesus the human, you see the one who reflects God's image to the world like all of us were designed to do in the beginning, but he did it perfectly. On the other hand, you also see this is the imprint of God. If you wanna know what God is, this Jesus defines God. You following? So it has kind of a double-edged meaning here. And it goes on, it says, the one who is first over all creation because all things were, again, created by him, both in the heavens and on the earth. He existed before all things and all things are held together in him. Jesus is the cosmic glue that brings everything that matters and into existence and sustains it. Everything that matters is sustained by Jesus. We don't know how that happens. We're not looking for a scientific principle for what that means. We just know that without Jesus, this world, this universe, well, it's gone. That's how big of a deal Jesus is. And so as we look at Jesus, we see the one who does the humanity thing perfectly. We see the God who has perfect, loving character that wants to create within us a people who make this world look more like the world God designed it to be in the first place. God looks like Jesus and then we might say, Jesus shows us a new way to be human together. He shows us. You know, there's really like nothing more revolutionary about Christianity than Jesus. It's why people who don't like Christianity still are like learning from Jesus. It's why Gandhi, in the middle of all his peacemaking work that he tried to do, would read the Sermon on the Mount daily, I read somewhere this week. He didn't believe in Jesus, I don't think. Maybe he did. But he saw in Jesus someone who transforms everything. And sometimes I think we, we get busy and bogged down by the hard things of life, by the routine of life. And what's at my center is, I've just got to get through the workday today. I'm tired. I've just got to get to the next thing I'm busy. 
And you know what I think Jesus would say? Something to the effect of, hey, when you're tired, what if I could be tired with you? When you're busy, I'll, I'll just be busy with you. Just put me in the center of that. In Matthew, he actually says as much. And I'm reading from the message because I love how it draws out the sort of nuanced meaning um, around what Jesus is saying here. So in Matthew chapter 11, this is a bit of a paraphrase. It says this, are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me, get away with me and, I'll, uh, and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lately. Jesus wants to be your teacher. There's good books out there, self-help stuff, you know, how do I organize my life and my calendar so that I'm the most effective? How do I do a four hour work week or whatever? Like, you know, there, there's all of these great tools out there. And I say, where they're helpful, great, good. But Jesus is like, look at my life. Not just like abstractly, but when you follow Jesus because the spirit of Jesus is in your life, this passage didn't just apply to first century disciples in the Middle East somewhere when he said it, it applies to you and me because you have access to the same Jesus each and every moment of each and every day. We can learn from him, we can watch him, we can work with him, we can fail next to him, not with him, he's not gonna fail, right? Jesus wants to be in your mess so that he can show you how even in the mess, you can be free. You can experience a lightness in the chaos. You can glow where it's dark and gloomy. You know, there, there's always something interesting. You, you've probably heard of like couples who, I don't know, I don't know any of these couples, but I, I hear of it occasionally like online or whatever, right? There's people that start to look like each other a little bit. Have you ever heard about this phenomenon? And maybe it's just because they use the same hair product. I don't know, right? You know, I, I, I've, I use very uh, different hair products and I have a different skincare routine than I did when I was a bachelor. Am I slowly morphing into Lauren? I don't know. I think she would say no. She would say gross. But you may have heard of this, right? Um, and the same thing is true about owners of dogs and their pets. In fact, one, one photographer went all in on this. And I want to show you just a slide full of really beautiful images of pets who look like their owners. I mean, the last one with the flailing hair is just, oh like Fabio goodness, right? Like this is, right? And I think it's super interesting though that, that people think like this, like, hey, the more you're around someone, the more you start to kind of look like them. And Jesus really says the same thing. I mean, not at this dramatic glory. Um, I mean, oh my gosh, the, the priest. Oh, wow, that's so good. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm going to distract myself from my point really quick as I reacquaint myself with this awesome, awesome, anyway, um, sorry. Uh, well, I think you get the idea. The more you're with Jesus, the more you're gonna look like him. Now, now you're not gonna become like a, a Jewish Middle East man. Half of you are like, yeah, I can't become a man, bro. Come on, right? But your character, applied in our setting, applied in 21st century realities. That's what Jesus wants to show you how to do better and better, not out of obligation, not out of law, not out of like, you better, you must, you are not good enough, but rather, what if I showed you the best way to be human and how to relate to all the people around you as you did that? Who better to teach us than Jesus himself. In fact, Philippians puts it this way. 
Paul in Philippians 2 wrote, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. I I want us to pause here for a second and just hear out Paul, which this is big. This is poetic almost. This is creedal in a sense. He starts with something very practical. You want to know how to live together? Take on the mindset, take on the attitude, take on the posture of Jesus. And here's what that posture looks like. Creator of the universe, God of heaven, becoming human. And not just like any human. He didn't take over Rome. He didn't become just like the best, richest, most powerful human. He was humble. He was sacrificial. He was executed. He had this character of humility that just fascinates us to this day. So Paul's all all in on Jesus and saying, look, if you can learn to be humble and put Jesus at the center and his way of living and his attitude, you're gonna know how to love each other better. You're going to be a different kind of human being. You are gonna be a different kind of human community. Jesus at the center changes everything. And and Paul just wants to make clear the ramifications of this. He says, verse nine, therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Over and over again, Jesus is God, Jesus is Lord, Jesus is the creator, Jesus is the point, Jesus is the center, Jesus is your model. Follow Jesus, be like Jesus, learn from Jesus. And don't get it twisted. He's your friend, but he's also your king. He's also your Lord. He's also the headmaster of the party. Whatever metaphor you need to use, Jesus is the focal point of it. And so one last big idea here that helps us kind of shape our time together. It says this, Jesus is Lord is God's good news for this world. Jesus is Lord is God's good news for this world. In, in this passage in particular, to declare Jesus is Lord, as we may have said elsewhere, is to under your breath say, the person who claims to be the Lord of this world isn't. And who was that person? Caesar, yeah. I know, you were all about to say Caesar, right? Yeah. Yeah, to say Jesus is Lord is to say Caesar isn't. So, so when you wanna put Caesar in the middle of the world, don't buy into that, that's malarkey. Like, don't waste your time with it. When you wanna put ideology in the middle, don't, wa- <laughs> don't. Jesus has started a movement that is for everyone else and your life is in submission to him. And when it's in submission to him, it's light, it's free, it's heavy, but it's good. And it's good beyond you. It is for this world. So to summarize here a bit, Our center determines our shaping. We're we're saying Jesus should be the center that is the shaper. And how we see Jesus, how we see God matters, how we live the human life with Jesus matters, and how we love others and give our ultimate allegiance to Jesus. This matters. And so I ask a simple question, which center is shaping you? Which center is shaping you. It would be very easy to walk away from this question, either doing one of two things. Well, of course it's Jesus. Jesus is the center because I I believe in Jesus, 
I was baptized at 12. I come to church. So it's Jesus. You know, that's one way to kind of look at it. The other side of the extreme might be, oh, I love Jesus with all my heart, except I'm terrible at following him. Therefore, I must not. And you go into a cycle of, am I a Christian? Am I anything? You know, right? So you can be overly just sort of like dismissive of the question on the one hand, or you could be like driven towards legalistic rumination in your mind that isn't anything like Jesus offered you when he said, follow me, watch how I do it, learn from me. This question is for all of us, wherever we are in our spiritual journey, including maybe those of us who don't follow Jesus at all yet. Maybe you're exploring Christianity or you came here with a friend. You know, that, that question, because all of us have something in the center or a few things in our center, that we could say, yeah, I'm pursuing these things and they take first place in my life. Sometimes, one time, right? As you negotiate how intense it really is for you. But what if we increased our capacity to ask that question when we're making a decision? What if we, we had a huge decision about life and instead of just saying, oh, I should ask some really smart people about that, we also said, what center is shaping me as I approach this question or this decision or this moment? Or what center is shaping me as I parent in a particular way? What center is shaping me as I work towards certain kind of goals? Because goals are good. But could goals be the outcome of a Jesus-centered life rather than goals being the center that we attach Jesus to later on and say, thank you, I'm rich now because Jesus. Really? Don't get it twisted. Jesus says, when I'm at the center, you will learn to do things in a whole new way and it will change everything. It won't always be easy, but it will be good. You know, uh, as we close here, a couple of thoughts. Uh, one of my Bible nerdy heroes, as you all know, N.T. Wright, he uh, was asked about 10 years ago on a video interview I was watching, what, what do you hope your kids say about you? And what do you hope you leave with your kids? Like if, if when you pass, what is it you want them to really know and internalize. And this is what he said. He said he wants them to know God. And he, he says about God, if you want to know who God is, look at Jesus. If you want to know what it means to be human, look at Jesus. If you want to know what love is, look at Jesus. If you want to know what grief is, look at Jesus. And go on looking until you're not just a spectator, but you're actually part of the drama, which has him as the central character. Friends, that was off the cuff. That is wisdom. Look at Jesus. Grow with Jesus. For the sake of others, glow with Jesus. Jesus, Jesus at the center. Just imagine what this would be like if this were true of us here and now, today. During Christmas break, I took a few days off, hung out with the kiddos. That's bonkers, by the way, when the kids are home. Any of you know about that? Yeah, it's fun though, it's so fun, like so fun. And so my oldest, Lydia, comes up to me and says, Dad, you know, she's been kind of into Carmen San Diego. Like there's a reboot on Netflix. It's actually pretty good. Anyway, just throw it out there, right? If you remember Carmen San Diego. And then we just watched uh, uh, National Treasure, which is pretty interesting, right? There's all this like mystery, right? So spies and mystery. And she's just like intrigued by this. So she says, hey, could we play spies today? And I was like, yeah, yeah. Can you make me a spy badge? Yeah, I can figure this out, right? And so I get on Canva, which if you know what Canva is, it's just like an art tool for people who don't know how to do art or who are smart enough to say they got the tools and it's faster. Um, and this is what we came up with. 
These are their um, PR photos, so they're very somber, right? Just like a private agent or a secret agent should be, right? So I was like, that's perfect, you know? They look like operatives. And I was like, well, I want to promote good things here, not violence. So uh, I came up with the International Agency of Good. I thought that was pretty good. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, dad, home run. Yeah. Anyway, and so that night we went throughout the house. It was dark. Lauren was out doing whatever Lauren was doing. And I was with the kids and um, all the lights go out. And in every room we would come to as spies, there would be little clues written on cards with this pen. And she, Lydia did this and she wrote the clues with the pen, but this is invisible ink. And so what do you have to do to see invisible ink? You have to make it glow, right? You have to shine light on it. And so we would get a clue and we'd shine the light and she would read it to me because I couldn't see, I don't know, it's not easy. And here's what I hope we take away from today. When Jesus is at the center of our lives, people that don't know that Jesus is for them, suddenly the glow of God just like, oh, what's that about? Right, like, like when, when people see that you are glowing, that you are pursuing Jesus at the center and your life is a light up on a hill that is not being covered up, but it is good. The impact you can have in that one relationship you can't even calculate it. This isn't like, hey man, I noticed that you know your your life just looks awesome. Like I just admire all this stuff about you. That's not always a segue to say, have you heard the four spiritual laws, right? Like, like it might just be an opportunity to just share from your heart, like, yeah, like a big part of my life is just that I, I follow Jesus, like, and he's at the center of everything. And, and I don't know how to explain it perfectly, but what I do know is that the life that I live and how I live it, I wanna be more like him all the time. And I don't do that perfectly. I don't have it all together, but thanks for noticing a good moment, right? What if we were that? Could we be that together? Could you and I together make Calgary curious? Why are those people lighting up? Why are those people joyful? Why are those people wise? Why are those people slow to anger and quick to forgive? And you and I can answer with one simple core value. I've chosen to do all that I can to be Jesus-centered, to seek Jesus and his kingdom first. I'd love to show you what I've learned so far. That, my friends, is the invitation before us as we place Jesus at the center, give him first place in all that we do. Let's pray together. You, oh God, are so gracious and kind. We thank you that you look like Jesus, you are Jesus, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You animate our world and invite our lives to come into further alignment with you, Jesus. If anyone here today, God, is curious about you, may they know that the the main thing is that you get first place, that you are in the center, that before any of the tradition, before any of the ideas, you are the point. And for those of us on the journey, learning to follow you, seeking to put you in the center of our lives and our church, our families, our friendships, help us to see you with greater clarity so that others through us will see you and all of your light, all of your love. 
Thank you that I'm not the center of the world, that we're not the center of the world. That's a lot of pressure. But you, you know how to do that. Help us learn from you and walk with you as you continue to light this world up with your love. We pray all of this in the strong and powerful name of Jesus who lived, died, rose again, and is seated in the highest place of honor and is present with us in this room right now. Amen.